Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the first live webcast of this season. This season, we have changed from Tuesdays to Mondays, uh, following a poll that we had in the uh, user group on Facebook, where it turned out that a lot more people were able to watch on Mondays. So we're expecting blistering viewer numbers today, hopefully. Um, today I have a uh, special for you uh, on performance, where I will be talking about everything from computer choice to operating system and things to do within Capture. But before we get to that, I'd like to cover some things that's happened since, uh, since our last webcast. So let's have a look at the news. Back in uh, January, uh, we launched our uh, Showcase Reward Program. Uh, it's a program where if you submit your showcase to us and uh, conform to some criteria, uh, then we may choose it to promote it on social media and our website, uh, in return for which you will uh, receive an upgrade to the, uh, to the next version or the current version in case you haven't upgraded yet. We've received a few showcases already that you can view on our website. I was just showing you one from uh, a laser design in Dubai. Here is uh, a, a German designer um, from Casper's tour, I believe earlier this year. Another showcase from Australia. So we're trying to get showcases from all over the world and interesting projects, of course. Um, we don't have a fixed number of showcases that we promote on a regular basis, so it's a little bit as it comes. Furthermore, there was a book released earlier this spring-ish, around June, I believe. It is called Capture for Lighting Design. It's actually, it's the first textbook on Capture. It takes you uh, step by step through Capture. It, uh, as the writers say, it's intended for anyone wanting to learn to use Capture. It assumes no previous experience of Capture, and it also touches a few other softwares, namely the ETC's EOS Nomad, uh, Lightrite 6, and SketchUp. So it's a great resource if you want to get into Capture, if you're a lighting design student, or if you simply want to learn more ways of using Capture. It's available on Amazon, it's $39.95, it's paperback, and uh, ship note is pretty quick. I have heard that it's not actually shipping to all countries. I'm not sure why. Um, maybe it's some limitation of Amazon, we're not sure, but we're not the publishers of the book, so that is out of our control. We also have a couple of shows coming up. We have the Plaza Show in London. This is actually just a couple of weeks away. I will personally be attending this show in London. I will also be having or holding a talk uh, at the White Light stand. So White Light will be representing Capture in London on Plaza. We also have LDI in Las Vegas. This is in about six weeks. Uh, in the uh, convention center in Vegas, as usual. And in Vegas, we will be represented by Elation, who are our US dealers. And uh, I believe uh, they will be showing Capture together with their new control product range, the uh, Obsidian control range. So if you're in the US, make sure to come to Vegas and check out Capture 2018 if you haven't already seen it. So that concludes the new section, and uh, I'm gonna dive straight into our performance special. Now, if you have any questions as I go through these bits here, please write them in the comments field here on Facebook, and I'll try and answer them as fast as possible or, or when it fits in. I have a screen here on the side where I could see any questions coming in, so that's why I will be going like this. So I will be covering four different sections from the choice of computer, how to build a computer, how this whole performance thing kind of works, and finally some considerations for how to design and capture if you want to have performance in mind. 
So one of the most common questions we get is, what kind of computer should I buy if I want to design and visualize on Capture? Obviously, this is a bit of an infected question, the old PC versus Mac. So many users will be choosing PC or Mac based on either personal preference or other software they are using on PC or Mac that they need to continue using or, or want to continue using. The fact is that if you have the same or equivalent hardware on the PC and the Mac, the performance is virtually identical. So there is no sort of obvious go here or there to get better performance. It all comes down to the hardware you have. Now, Capture runs on both Windows and Mac OS, which means you can create and design on Windows and Mac, and you take, can take the project files and go back and forth between the systems. So you don't necessarily have to choose one platform. However, I will say specifically, there is no point in using a virtualized operating system with a product like Capture, and especially not Parallels on a Mac. Now, the main reason for this is that the video card drivers that are available for these environments, they are not good enough. They're good enough for your Outlook word processing kind of situation or scenario, um, but for graphics intense applications such as Capture, the virtual, virtualized uh, platforms, they don't cut it. So you need to go, you need to run, as they say, on the rails of Windows or Mac OS. So one choice you can, or the first choice perhaps, is, is whether you want to use a laptop or a desktop. So let's start and talk a little bit about the laptop scenario. As I mentioned, the most important bit is the hardware when it comes to performance. And the key component of hardware for Capture is the video card. Now the top of the line Mac video card of the MacBook Pro 15 inch scores around 3,500 performance points on, <laughs> well, this is failing badly. Anyway, videocardbenchmark.net. This is a website that gathers benchmarking information for different video cards. It's not absolute, it's not necessarily the perfect benchmark for capture, but it is a very good resource for comparing the performance of video cards. So as I mentioned, the top of the line MacBook Pro's video card scores around three and a half thousand performance points, whereas a top of the line PC laptop scores around 11,000 performance points. And that PC laptop is probably going to cost you less than the Mac laptop. Now, the Mac laptops are incredible in many other ways, like the computer screen, the touchpad, and the ecosystem, and all these things. But when it comes to raw capture performance, the video card of the Mac laptops are less powerful than the PC laptops. I believe the one we have on picture here is the new Razer 15 inch, which has some really nice specifications. Now a hybrid solution between the laptop and the desktop is using an external graphics card enclosure. This is the Sonet eGFX. It's an external graphics card enclosure, so it's about the size of a graphics card, obviously. Well, it's, it's something like this. So it's like a really small box that you would have next to your computer, your laptop, normally. And it allows you to use a powerful graphics card together with your laptop. And it allows you to upgrade your graphics card in the future. Whereas normally in a laptop, you're not able to upgrade the graphics card. So when, the, when new models come out with more powerful graphics cards, you essentially need to replace the entire laptop. Whereas with an external graphics enclosure, you could upgrade the graphics card. So this is, as I mentioned, the eGFX from Sonnet, where you could 
I put a Radeon Pro Vega 64, which scores some 13,000 amazing performance points. Be a little bit careful though, and take some time to study which enclosures are out there and how well they work with your operating system. For instance, Apple has a specific page where you can see their recommendations on officially supported graphics card enclosures. So make sure to pay attention to that. And if you choose a non-standard configuration, if you're among the enthusiasts, there are dedicated sites for external graphics card. There's something like a community around it. Um, keep in mind this technology hasn't been widespread until quite recently, so if you stray aside from the, the mainstream choices set out by Apple or Microsoft, then you could be running into issues. Finally, we have perhaps the most obvious choice for those who wants to get the maximum performance out of their computer, that is to use a stationary desktop computer. I've got here the, uh, the iMac 27 inch top of the line that scores around seven and a half thousand performance points. On the other hand, a, a PC computer with the card of your choice, since you can essentially fit it with anything, you can score up to 15,000 and even more points. So if you really are looking for the raw hardcore performance and want to be able to choose exactly which card you use, then the PC desktop is the best choice for you. Now, if you take it the furthest step and actually look at building your own computer and you want to choose components specifically, then the number two most important components are the GPU, the video card, and the CPU. Now, in terms of comparing GPUs, as I said, take a look at videocardbenchmark.net. And in terms of the CPU, take a look at the the clock frequency, the gigahertz of the processor. I have a question here that I'm gonna get back to in a short moment. I also wanna mention that when it comes to the clock frequency of the CPU, there are a few caveats that I will come to in a moment. It's not quite as simple as it might seem at first glance. So also screenshotted here are a couple of tools that you will be using if you've built your own PC and you wanna see how incredibly fast it is. It's the, the task manager in Windows or GPU Z, which is a nice utility for monitoring the, the temperature and the speed and what is limiting the performance of your graphics card at any given moment. So I had a question here, if it's possible to use Capture with an Oculus Rift for show visualization to look around? The answer is no, it is not, not yet. Something we have on our radar, although we don't have a definite date for when this might be possible. Essentially, it comes down to, to better performance uh, management in Capture. We need a better automatic quality mode to hit the, the hard frame rate limits required by virtual reality. So now I'm going to take a little bit of a deep dive into the world of performance for those who are truly interested in what happens in the task manager or GPU-Z or why is my computer not performing as I had expected it to. In the beginning of times, the computer had a processor, the CPU, and this would do a bit of work to prepare what should go on screen for the next frame. Now keep in mind, the computer screen changes contents at a fixed frequency of around 30, 60 hertz. So the CPU has a very strict deadline for when the graphics for the next frame should be ready. Ideally, the computer can do a bit of work and still have some headroom until the content changes on screen, the next frame appears. Now, what happens if your CPU is not fast enough or, well, if, well, what happens if your CPU is not fast enough is that it will take the CPU more time to prepare the contents of the next frame and miss the deadline for the frame. What happens then is the content is simply displayed 
at the next given opportunity to present a new frame, which means you will be getting frame drops. So if your CPU is on high load, sometimes when the screen presents new content, there simply is no new content because the CPU isn't done. This is when your frame rate counter decreases. If you're lucky, you will hit every second frame or every fourth frame and it will be a smooth flow, but more likely it will be a little bit hit and miss and you get frame rates like 20 FPS or 22, which doesn't even, isn't even a, an even divider of the hertz of your computer screen. So what happened to overcome this was that dedicated graphics processors were introduced, the GPUs, the video cards. The idea being that they would be specialized in computer graphics, so they would offload the CPU and allow us to do more elaborate things on the computer screen. The way this works is that the CPU prepares a package of instructions for the GPU to deliver. So the CPU spends a little bit time on compiling instructions for the CPU, GPU, passes it on to the GPU, which then renders the frames on screen. Now, of course, if you're asking the GPU to do too much, or if the GPU is simply slow, then the GPU can miss frames as well, just in the same way as the CPU misses frames. So you would get frame drops, and not the ideal frame rate counters that you had expected. So this is a scenario that we call GPU bound. This is when the GPU restricts your performance. This is when you will see 100% load on the GPU while the CPU isn't that heavily loaded and still you're not getting a high frame rate. In this scenario, there is nothing the CPU can do really to improve the situation. Using the CPU more in this scenario would not help. It's the GPU that is too slow. Now the opposite scenario can happen as well, and especially these days when video cards have become so incredibly fast that no matter what we tell them to do, they're done in an instant. And the more visual effects we add to the visualization, um, global illumination or anti-aliasing or, or the fill lighting we do in capture, all these tasks that are to be done by the CPU, sorry, the GPU, they have to be directed by the CPU. And when it takes too long for the CPU to tell the video card what to do, you end up with the CPU stuck at 100%, the GPU is sipping cocktails on the beach, and you're getting a low frame rate. So this is the situation we call CPU bound. That is when your CPU is not fast enough for the situation. Now I mentioned before when I spoke about the clock frequency of the CPU, when you're choosing the processor for your computer, it's tempting to go for the one with most cores, for instance, or maybe you might go for the one with the highest gigahertz. Now, at the moment, Capture is not capable of utilizing multiple cores in passing instructions to the GPU. As a result of that, it is actually better to have a high clock frequency, a high gigahertz number, to avoid the CPU from becoming the bottleneck. Now in this context, there's one important difference between the Mac and Windows, if you open the task manager on Windows or the activity monitor on Mac, there's a percentage showing how heavy the load is on the CPU. On Windows, if you have four cores and one of them is working at a maximum, Windows says your load is 25%. On Mac, in the same scenario, it will say the load is 100%. So on the Mac, the percentage is that of one core. So if you were actually maxing out four cores, you would have a 400% load on the Mac and 100% load on Windows. And the trick in Windows to see the individual cores in the task manager 
is to right click, I believe, in the task manager and select show logical processors. That gives you this graph here with the individual boxes for each core. And on Mac OS, um, you can double click at a relatively obvious location to get the table overview of the individual cores as well. So at the moment, go for the processor with a high gigahertz and few cores, but keep in mind that we are working on improving the multi-threading behavior of capture in the future, in the relatively near future. So that capture will make use of more cores relatively soon. And this is a general dilemma for us when people ask us what computer to get is that there is one question for how capture behaves today, but we also know where we are headed in the near future, which is likely slightly different. So we try to balance our recommendation for something in between. <coughs> Excuse me. So once you have your dream computer in place and you are ready for to visualize to design, there are a number of things you can have in mind inside Capture as you're working if you want to get good performance out of the visualization. The first one is that the most expensive part of the visualization is the fog, the atmosphere, the haze. The, the calculation of what the beams look like in the smoke are relatively expensive. So if you can dispose completely of the atmosphere, you can have high performance gains. It also helps to restrict the area where the smoke is. This is one of the reasons we introduced smoke boxes back in Capture Nexum, I believe it was. It is a method to limit the area of space where there is smoke. So restricting smoke is a good way of improving performance in capture. Another good way of improving performance is reducing the number of shadows. Each and every object that casts a shadow leads to extra calculations whenever you move a fixture. It's the same whether the fixture moves or whether it is rotating. So as a moving head sweeps over other objects that cast shadows, this adds to the processing, especially if the moving head itself is casting shadows because it's the moving head's rotation will then trigger a lot of processing of all fixtures that hit that fixture. Uh, in the example image here, I've turned off cast shadows for the selected piece of truss and fixture. So if you look carefully, you could see there is no shadow from half of the truss on that one fixture. The default setting is for trusses to cast shadows and for fixtures that rotate to not cast shadows. So if you have drawn a lot of trussing, you uh, have a lot of moving heads and the performance is low, it may be worth disabling the cast shadow property of the trusses. Moving on, there is another property called throws light, which is also very important. Obviously a good, good way of escaping the performance penalty of the beams is to eliminate the beams. Now, if you have decorative fixtures such as LED fixtures integrated in your scenery, for instance, then sometimes it's perfectly okay to not get the beams from the fixtures. And that's when you can disable the throws light property and eliminate the beams from these fixture. And this is very good for your frame rate as well. Finally, I want to mention the rendering settings as well. And these are extremely powerful and actually probably your first go-to solution, but I wanted to mention the other things first because they are also incredibly important. So when it comes to rendering settings, there's a host of rendering settings that can modify the visualization quite a lot. Now, in this sample picture here, I've really taken them down to a minimum and the visualization is not very impressive. It's, 
It's not the type of renders you would typically show to a customer or, or the director. But when pre-programming, if what you need is a good frame rate, then maybe it's worth it to take down the quality settings. I'm going to mention a few key settings here. And the first one is the one called atmospheric resolution. This is essentially the resolution of the smoke, which as I mentioned before, is the most expensive part of the visualization. So if you can reduce the resolution of the atmosphere, then you can gain a lot of frame rates. Second one is the one called in the old rendering engine, which was called resolution scaling. And in the new rendering engine, it's called resolution limit. That's like a virtual resolution on the entire visualization, which of course also improves performance if you can reduce it. So keep in mind, if you have a very high resolution monitor, something like a 4K or, or one of those 3K widescreen things, the more pixels you have on screen, the more capture has to work to present the visualization. So if you can have a screen with lower resolution or lower the resolution virtually by using the, um, the resolution limit or resolution scaling, that is a powerful way of improving performance. Now there are other settings here as well, such as the, um, the beam atmospheric detail. Um, we have the spill lighting, we have the, the shadow resolution. <coughs> These all can be used to improve the performance, but the key ones are atmospheric resolution and resolution limit slash scaling. So we have a question here whether an i5 8400 and GTX 1060 is okay for capture. Well, to be honest, I have no idea, but this is how I would decide. To begin with, I would go to videocardbenchmark.net and check out the performance point for the GTX 1060. If memory serves me right, you will find that that is a relatively high ranking graphics card. So I think with the GTX 1060, you are relatively well off. It's not the fastest card on the market, but in comparison to the price, it's good value for the money and the performance is solid. Now the best way of evaluating whether the performance is good enough is to actually try it. So if the computer you are considering is an off-the-shelf computer available in a computer store, the best thing you could do is, is take a project file on a USB stick with you to the store along with a capture demo on it, or if you've made a presentation file, and ask to run it on the computer. That's the best way of assessing the performance of the computer, really. We have a question from Steve Irwin. Uh, he's asking about the resolution scaling. Uh, so the resolution scaling slash limit, as I said, so it's a setting that's changed name with our new rendering engine. So if you're running on the OpenGL rendering engine, it will say resolution scaling. And if you're running on the new engine, it will say resolution limit. And if you're running the new engine, the resolution limit is, is actually specifies the number of vertical pixels that the render happens in. So I think we have something like 540p, 720p, and there is a, a setting for the unlimited resolution as well. So if you have any more questions, please um, keep them coming. Now, <coughs> I would also like to say that the way we've chosen the rendering settings in Capture, it is not realistic for anyone to be running a visualization on the maximum settings. To visualize on the maximum settings is actually nearly equivalent to doing an offline render. So the maximum settings here are what's used for the offline renders. So if you could run that in real time, there would be no point to have the offline renders anymore. So it is quite normal and expected to have the settings on medium or even low. But in some scenarios, if you are shooting light through complicated geometry, you may need to increase the shadow resolution, for instance, which will decrease performance a bit. You, 
you will discover that in some scenarios you need to increase specific settings because it's needed in your project. So this concludes um, the bits I wanted to talk about. It doesn't seem like we have any further questions, perhaps one, yes. Uh, there's a feature request whether we could add a workload meter for GPU and CPU in Capture. Um, that's a good question. We have at the moment, you can enable what we call uh, quality information in the view. It, it shows you a frame rate counter. And the fact is that it's actually very difficult to measure the workload on the GPU. Um, it's not even clear how the activity monitor in Windows or sorry, the activity monitor in Mac OS or the task manager in Windows does it today. Um, we actually believe it's, it's actually measuring the amount of communication between the GPU and the CPU and not really the workload. Um, but it's something uh, we will take into consideration and see if we can do something to, to deliver something like that. Top priority for us at the moment with the new rendering engine will be improving performance. Um, having moved to DirectX and Mathel, we have a lot of new tools available for us that simply don't exist for OpenGL. Um, so we are actually pretty excited about the, the near future here, as we've invested a lot of time simply moving away from, from OpenGL. So it seems like we have no more questions. Uh, so thanks everyone for watching. And we'll be back again in about a month and we'll be running a number of webcasts this season with a focus on Capture together with something else. So we're going to take a look at Capture together with a couple of lighting consoles, as well as Capture together with another software before the end of this year. So again, thank you very much and uh, see you in a month again.